this recording. Recording in progress. Well, here we are. And um, oops. Welcome everyone to City Wildlife's seminar on bat conservation. My name is Jim Bonsma. If you've been to these before, you have probably um, heard my voice and seen a little bit of me. I'm the director of City Wildlife. I think you all know who we are, but we are the District of Columbia's first and still only wildlife rehabilitation facility. Um, and we like to do a lot of education with these things because we've attracted, uh, evidently, a lot of people who care a lot about wildlife. Tonight, very special occasion, we are joined by Erin Cord, who is with an organization called Bat Conservation International, which if you are not familiar with Bat Conservation International or BCI, as some people say, I urge you to check it out. It's a great group. Erin um, herself has been there for, um, let me see, a little over 10 years, no, not quite. She joined in 2019, so however many years that is, but she's doing community engagement work um, there. But she's from this area, from Delaware originally, and went to the University of Delaware, where she had a um, double major in wildlife ecology and entomology. Then she went on to get a master's degree it, from the Caesar Kleber Wildlife Research Institute, which I probably said wrong, at Texas no, A&M in Kingsville. It's I said it right. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're good. It's a mouthful. Yeah, How you're good. That? But <laughs> since then, she has 10 years, Erin does, of experience working with volunteer outreach education programs, um, all on the environment. She says she's happiest working at the intersection of science communication and citizen empowerment and loves to get people excited about wildlife conservation and environmental stewardship. So a very good match. Um, Aaron likes to get people excited about wildlife conservation and we are a group that likes to be excited about wildlife conservation. So without with saying too much more, um, I'll let Aaron start in just one second. But as always, a big, huge thank you to Mel Gardner, with the magic hands that does the American Sign Language for us, a huge part. We're very grateful, Mel, to have you join us again. Thank you so much for your help. So, Erin, um, why don't you just get started when you're ready? Okay. Thank you so much, Jim. And thank you again, Mel. I appreciate you so much. Uh, it's very exciting to have a sign language interpretation of the presentation. Um, yeah, but thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really admire what you do at City Wildlife. I think it's super important. And I'm so excited that y'all want to hear about bats because it's one of my most favorite topics. <laughs> um, but yeah, my name's Erin Cord. I work for Bat Conservation International, as Jim said. And I'm going to talk to you guys today about all things bats. So let's get started. So if you haven't heard of our organization, uh, we are a nonprofit. We started in 1982, so we've been around for over 40 years now. And our mission, it's a simple one, but it is very complicated. We want to end bat extinctions worldwide. You know, and there's a lot of things going on in the world that makes it very complicated and hard to do, but that is what we are devoted to. So when we first started, we were quite small, just in Austin, Texas, which is actually where I am based. Um, some of you may have been to Austin or heard of our famous bats downtown. Um, they were the reason we got started here. But since then, we have about over 50 employees kind of all over the country. And we work all over the world now with all different species of bats. Um, we have a huge conservation program. We do a lot of research with our science team. And then I'm kind of on the people side, which is just outreach, education, and engagement, and getting people excited about bats, because I think they're really, really interesting and amazing creatures. I don't know why they're, can you guys see a red line on my presentation? I don't know how I yeah, did it's that. it's there. I don't know where that comes from. I don't either. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to get rid of it. That's. <laughs> we can ignore it. Right. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let me just... Uh, Put it on a different screen. I'm sorry for the technical delay. Okay, you see it? See Bat Basics? Okay. See Bat oh, yeah. Basics. First yes. things, great. Thank you, Tim. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on with my computer. Okay. Um, so, the first thing I like to do is start talking about some common bat myths that you have maybe heard or maybe have said yourself um, and explain to you why they're not true. 
And I think a lot of these myths kind of lead to people feeling a certain way about bats, you know, whether they're afraid of them or don't really like them. I think a lot of that is related to kind of misinformation. So the first one is this idea that bats are blind, you know, that they can't see very well. You know, I, my grandma used to say she was blind as a bat all the time. Um, and bats can see about as well as we can. You know, they have different sized eyes depending on the species. So some of the larger fruit bats have really large eyes. They can see quite well. You know, some of the smaller bats, the insectivorous bats that we have here um, in the U.S., you know, they have smaller eyes, but they can still see pretty much as well as we can. But bats sort of have the superpower of echolocation. And so what that means is they actually use sound to interpret their environment, which is really wild for us as humans to think about because we interpret everything. You know, many people interpret things through kind of sight. So using sound is kind of a different way to think about it. Bats actually will throw out sound. And these are kind of in the form of chirps. Usually this is at a higher frequency than our ears can hear. So normally we cannot hear bats echo echolocating, but they send out this sound in chirps and the sound bounces off of objects and it allows them to see. So this is how they hunt at night and this is sort of their superpower. So they can see quite well, uh, but they hunt at night. And when they do that, they're not using their eyes. Um, they're using their, their voices, their echolocation abilities. So bats are not blind. Uh, the second myth is bats are rats with wings or, or kind of this idea that bats are vermin. This is not a real uh, species. This is created by the internet just to kind of drive that point home. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think bats are kind of gross or carry disease, you know, and they associate them with rodents or kind of vermin, things that we think about. Um, but bats are actually more closely related um, you know, we've done some DNA analysis and we found they're more closely related to humans and horses than they actually are with rodents, which may sound surprising, but, you know, they're not very similar to rodents. They are the same size and they kind of outwardly, you know, superficially may look like them a bit. But bats are very different. But one of their main differences is they reproduce very, very slowly. So, you know, you could have a rat or a mouse in your shed, and then you're gonna have a lot of rats and mice in your shed very quickly. Um, but bats usually give birth to about one pup per year and that's it. So they reproduce quite slowly for their size. And as I said, they're really not that closely related to rodents. They're in their own taxonomic order, which I'll talk about more in a second. Another myth that I've heard, which is a little bit old school, but maybe you've heard it, is that bats want to get in your hair or this fear that they're going to kind of attack your hair or want to, want to roost in your hair. This is not true. You know, bats don't want to mess with people. We're big and scary. So, and bats can actually echolocate something as thin as one human hair. So very, very tiny. They're very good at navigating their environment using sound. So they're not going to kind of accidentally crash into your head. There are stories I've heard where someone's like, but that happened to me. And almost always it's sort of in a situation where a bat is in a house, there's tons of light, there's tons of sound, and the bat's not actually able to echolocate, you know, effectively. So that could be what's going on there. But I would say generally bats don't want anything to do with people and they do not want to mess with your hair. Uh, another myth that I hear a lot, and I think this is still very much perpetuated by particularly health departments, um, is that bats, you know, carry rabies more than other mammals, or all bats have rabies, or bats have rabies very often, you know, and I think uh, about less than 1% of wild bats actually have rabies, so it's a very, very small number within the population, but, you know, with when people actually encounter bats, there's sort of the sampling bias, so, you know, if you encounter a bat, usually, you know, there's millions of bats flying around at night that we never kind of interact with, but say you found a bat on the ground during the day, that is very potentially a sick bat. It might have rabies, it might not, but the point is you just wanna be safe. You wanna use common sense, you know, use gloves, tell kids not to pick up wildlife, that's always a good idea. But just make sure kind of you know what to do if you find something like that and just be really safe about it and just be, you know, use, use your common sense. But that being said, you know, you're probably more likely to get rabies from a raccoon or, you know, from a potentially even a dog. So bats don't necessarily have rabies more than other mammals. Any mammal can have rabies. It's more about just being smart about it. And then the last one is that all bats are vampire bats or bats want to suck your blood. Um, this is because, you know, on TV, they're always depicted as vampires and they're always associated with Dracula, you know, and if they're in movies or TV, they're always kind of scary and in castles and like attacking people. Um, but 
you know, and this is one of my most favorite bat facts is there's over 1400 species of bats that have been identified on the planet. And of those 1400, only three species actually specialize on feeding on blood. So there's only really three vampire bats. And of those three, only one feeds on the blood of a mammal. The other two feeds on feed on blood of birds. So there's really only one out of over 1400 species of bats that is a true vampire bat. They don't necessarily like to feed on people. Um, they're in Latin America and South America. They usually kind of um, will feed on the blood of cows or kind of larger deer, kind of larger mammals like that. You know, they're by no means flying and attacking something in the neck. They actually walk on the ground, which if you want to Google something cool, Google a vampire bat on a treadmill. Fascinating. Um, but they actually walk on the ground up to, you know, their sleeping prey. They curl up this little pug nose that they have right here that's quite cute, according to me. Um, they can sense blood kind of where it's close to the skin and they make a little incision and the blood pulls out and they actually lap it up. So they do not suck blood. Uh, they do not attack things, um, but you know, there are vampire bats. We don't have them in the United States. They're actually really fascinating and there's tons of interesting studies that have come out about vampire bats, but just to be clear, we don't have vampire bats and they are, you know, out of over 1400 species of bats, there's only one vampire bat. So as I said, bats are mammals, just like we are. And they, I love this picture because it shows how the bones in their wings are analogous to the bones that we have in our arms and hands. And so their wings are actually their fingers stretched out with skin kind of between each finger. You'll see the thumb right here. And this is, they're actually in the taxonomic order Chiroptera, which in Latin means hand wing, which makes a ton of sense once you kind of think about that. So, you know, their wings are their hands. So it always drives me nuts when I see like cartoon pictures of bats where they have like arms and hands and then they have wings on the back because you don't, you know, you either have arms or wings, you don't have both. So that's just something that bothers me personally. <laughs> but anyway, they are Chiroptera and they are not rodentia, not in the order for rodents. They are in their own order, literally means hand wing. So bats need our help. And that's kind of one of the things I really wanna drive home. Uh, there was a report that came out called the State of the Bats Report uh, in 2023. BCI, along with a lot of other partners, we all kind of tried to aggregate all the bat population data that was out there for North America. And we found that over 52% of North American bats are considered at risk, so over half of them. And this means they're either listed as endangered species, potentially going to be listed, or kind of have this documented decline or some larger threat that's, that's kind of threatening a decline of the population. So over half of our bats are really in trouble. So they really need our help now more than ever. So in the United States, you know, there's a couple of different reasons why our bats are having such a hard time. Uh, the main issues are the ones listed here. And I'll talk more about white nose syndrome in a bit, because that's definitely kind of the biggest threat to bats right now. Uh, wind energy is another one, which is kind of complicated because, you know, we love green energy. We really want to support green energy, but uh, bats seem to be very attracted to wind turbines. And there's a lot of, especially certain species of bats, that are attracted to these turbines tend to get killed by them. So it's something we're working on with the wind energy industry and, and with wind companies to try to mitigate that loss, but it is pretty complicated. And then habitat loss and destruction, which some of that is caused by people and development, and a lot of that is climate change as well. So there's kind of all these different factors going into that 52% of bats being at risk um, from that study. So I wanted to talk a little bit about why bats are important. You know, why do we why do we care if 52% of them are at risk? Well, all of the bats in where you guys live and most of the United States, all of them eat bugs. They are insectivorous. They love insects. They eat so many insects. A pregnant bat will eat her body weight in insects every single night. You know, and multiply that by a colony of pregnant bats and you've got a lot of insects being consumed every night. Um, a lot of the things they eat, you know, they, they eat a lot of moss, they eat a lot of beetles, they eat things that are pests to a lot of our crop species. So a study came out a couple of years ago that estimated that they save the agricultural industry billions of dollars every year just by eating these crop pests. So that's huge. I mean, that means, you know, less chemicals in our food through pesticides, 
And it really is supporting kind of our food system and bats are doing all this for free just by, you know, being themselves. So I have a cool video I wanted to share. So let me set this up for y'all. Uh, this is a spider in the middle. Um, there's a web kind of right there, if you can see it. You're gonna see a bat fly in. The bat's gonna, the bat is echolocating. We can't hear it uh, because it's too high pitched, but you'll see the bat sort of course correct and then go for the spider. And I do apologize if you're a big spider fan. Uh, spoiler alert, this guy does not make it, but you know, it's okay. This is a little old video. <laughs> okay, so here comes our bat. Sees the spider, or hears the spider, I should say, and grabs it. I'll play that one more time. And you see they use their tail as a scoop to kind of grab the insects that they're they're devouring. So yeah, pretty cool. And this next video, I don't think you'll be able to hear it also, um, but you're gonna see a moth right here in the middle. And then you're gonna see a bat fly up and do sort of this aerial acrobatic flip. And you'll see how the bat basically flips, grabs the moth with its tail, eats it, and then flies off to the next moth, just to give you a sense of how acrobatic they are when they're doing this kind of echolocation hunting. So there's our moth. There goes our bat. I do apologize for the darkness of the video. Bats are notoriously difficult to document because they come out at night. So it makes it a little bit harder. I'll play that one more time. There we go. Very impressive. And then it's on to the next insect. So another way bats are important is they're really, really important pollinators. Now we only have pollinating bats in the United States kind of in the desert Southwest. So there aren't any on the East Coast, um, but they tend to pollinate things like cactus flowers and agave. So if you do like tequila, if you like margaritas, you know, think of bat because bats are the primary pollinator of the agave plant, which is used to make tequila. Uh, but they also pollinate a lot of the wild type of some of kind of the crops that we use kind of in our food system. So bananas, guavas, mango, um, they're really important for about, I think they pollinate about 500 different species of economically and ecologically important plants. So it's quite a lot. Most of our pollinating bats are kind of south of the United States, kind of in warmer climates, but they're very important pollinators. They're also very efficient pollinators. So I'm gonna show you one more video. Now this is in a lab, I'm just gonna pause it real fast. You'll see sort of this beaker-like thing in the front. Um, there's a liquid at the bottom. So try to imagine that's sort of like a flower with nectar at the bottom. And then you're gonna see this pollinating bat come up and start to drink the nectar. Very cool. And you'll see it gets really far into this beaker. And you know, if this was a flower, he would be covered in pollen. And they, they transfer so much pollen when they're doing this that they're very, very good at it. There's the tongue, and then they just slurp it up like a straw. Get that nectar. I'll play it one more time. Get the, the entry to the flower, there we go. And that's how it goes, pretty neat. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about in terms of how bats are important is they're very important seed dispersers too. So we have a lot of species of fruit bats. We don't have any in the United States, but there is a lot of fruit bats kind of in tr more tropical areas all over the world. They eat lots of fruit. You know, they don't necessarily digest the seeds of the fruit. So out of their poop, which the fancy name for that is guano, out of their guano, you have a lot of seeds. Guano is an amazing fertilizer. You know, they used to actually mine guano for gardens and you can still buy guano fertilizer for your garden. But guano is a great way to kind of plant things. So, and this is a representation of like a clear cut area in the rainforest um, that's been completely cleared, you know, for logging or for cattle or for whatever reason. And generally most wildlife aren't gonna cross this. It's very exposed, it's very open. But fruit bats, you know, they don't care. They fly across it. And when they're flying, they're inevitably dropping guano. And within the guano is seeds. So about 95% of new growth in clear cut areas of the rainforest is due to fruit bats. So they're incredibly important for kind of forest regeneration in these areas. So talking more about kind of some of the threats to bats, as I said, I wanted to talk a little bit more about white nose syndrome, just to give you a sense of what it is. So white nose syndrome is a fungus that causes a disease. 
this fungus was brought to the United States by accident, probably by someone, we don't exactly know how, um, but it was probably someone who was in a cave in Europe or somewhere else where they do have a fungus as well, you know, didn't clean their gear, didn't clean their boots and accidentally brought that to a cave in New York, uh, New York State. The fungus since has spread kind of throughout the United States, but the issue is they get, and they get this little kind of white around their nose, which is where the name comes from. But when they do have the disease, and it mainly, it affects hibernating bats. So the bats that have white nose syndrome, it causes a lot of lesions on their skin and wings, and it makes it really hard for them to kind of thermoregulate properly, to kind of stay warm during hibernation. And so, and they're very irritated as well. So they end up waking up when they're hibernating. Every time they wake up, they use about a month's worth of food storage in their bodies or a month's worth of energy storage. So it's very costly energetically. And, you know, they eventually end up starving to death before spring has come and they can go out and feed. So, you know, when this first came on the scene in 2006, and I'll kind of explain this map real quick because it's a lot to look at, but basically it just shows white nose syndrome's march across the United States. You know, it started where this X is in New York State. You can see the colors represent the different years. So kind of initially it was just on the East Coast and then it started to sort of spread across the country. There are still a few states where it's not present. Um, where I am in Texas, we had our first white nose confirmed death, I think in 2020. Um, so it's still fairly new here and we're still kind of trying to you know, document the impact that it's having on bats. And there's kind of theories that it might not be as devastating in warmer climates because the bats are not hibernating for as long or potentially at all in certain cases. So, you know, since 2006, this has killed millions and millions of bats. There's, there's actually three species of bats that have lost over 90% of their population due to white nose syndrome. One of those is the little brown bat, which was the most common bat in your area for a very long time. So, you know, if you're an older, um, you remember looking at bats before 2006, that was probably little brown bats. They were very, very common. They have lost over 90% of their population since then. Um, and they're about to be listed as an endangered species. So it's been particularly devastating for a lot of species. You know, we have a whole white nose syndrome research team that is trying everything to sort of work on figuring this out. It's just really difficult because it's very contagious and it's very, very devastating. And, you know, certain bats that don't hibernate, you know, they can still carry the fungus but not be impacted by the disease. And, you know, they can spread it to bats that do hibernate. So it's really been hard to sort of figure out a solution. And I'm sure if you all have questions about that at the end of this, I'm happy to talk more about it. But I do recommend going to whitenosesyndrome.org. You know, that is an amazing resource uh, website. You can kind of find everything you need to know about white nose there. So happier topics. Let's talk about the bats of Washington, D.C. Uh, this is another, uh, you'll notice in the beginning of my presentation, I had a very cute fuzzy bat. That was an eastern red bat. This is also an Eastern red bat. They're probably one of my more, uh, one of my most favorite bats. It's hard to pick a favorite, but they are just adorable. Uh, so the first one I'm gonna talk about is the big brown bat. So this is definitely the most common bat in your area. As you can see, uh, this entire map is highlighted, which means they're found all over the United States, uh, but they are one of the bats that hasn't been as impacted by white nose syndrome. A Couple of different reasons for that. You know, some of it we're still trying to understand. It seems like they're a larger bodied bat, so they might be able to kind of, you know, have more food reserves and survive kind of the winter than some of the smaller bodied bats. They also roost in kind of a different part of the cave than the little brown bats, you know, which that cave temperature might be a little different, maybe not as favorable for the white nose fungus, but it's hard to know for sure. But little brown bats are very, very common. So if you see bats flying around, it's probably a little brown bat. And if you have a bat house or know of a bat house that's occupied, I almost guarantee it's gonna be little brown, or sorry, big brown bats. That's what I'm trying to say, big brown bats. So yes, very, very common. Uh, another one is the tricolored bat. This is uh, formerly was Eastern Pipistrelle. So we used to call them pips. They're very, very tiny, one of the smaller bats uh, in the area. As you can see, they're kind of all, found kind of all over the Eastern part of the United States. They tend to roost in caves, these guys hibernate, and they have been very impacted by white nose syndrome as well. So this is another one that has lost about 90% of their population since 2006, and will also probably be listed as endangered 
very soon. Um, so interesting note uh, with White Nose in Texas so far, I even hate to say this aloud, knock on wood, so far it has only impacted the cave myotis bats there and it hasn't spread to the tricolored bats yet. And we're just kind of crossing our fingers that maybe it won't be as devastating to the tricolored bats in Texas. Just trying to kind of wait to see. So we have a lot of people monitoring that situation. It's been really bad for the cave myotis, which is very tragic. Um, but we're still kind of holding out hope for the tricolored bats. And, you know, with them getting listed as endangered, it's very sad, but it also means, you know, more funding, more attention to kind of trying to, you know, restore this population. So lots going on with this. And I know it's quite sad, but just something to know. Uh, another bat, this one is actually just listed as endangered last year. Uh, the northern long-eared bat is another one found in your area. These guys are pretty uncommon. Uh, they tend to sort of be associated with forested areas, but this is another one that's been really impacted by white nose syndrome. And again, so the three species that have lost about 90% of their population are the northern long-eared bat, the tricolor bat that I just showed, and the little brown bat. So those three, unfortunately, have been particularly impacted by white nose syndrome. But, you know, this has been listed, and ideally, we can kind of do more work to try to figure this out. Because for the bat, bat people, this is kind of all hands on deck for white nose syndrome, and it has been for a very long time. There's a lot of brilliant people working on this, and it's been really complicated. And, you know, there just isn't sort of a clear cut answer yet. So there's our little brown bat that I was talking about that used to be probably the most common bat in the D.C. area. Um, they're still around, and there are stories. I hear kind of anecdotal stories of people who say, you know, they have seen and heard there are sort of smaller colonies on the East Coast that seem to have survived that are still there. So, you know, with certain diseases, sometimes there's kind of this, you know, initial die off and then kind of following that arc of the disease. And there are some survivors and then potentially those survivors can kind of deal with the fungus, deal with the disease and maybe not die and then kind of hopefully pass those genes on. So we're maybe seeing that happening in real time, but it's very hard to know because it is kind of happening in real time. And it's hard because there's so many other sort of environmental factors involved with bat declines that, you know, it's hard to know what it is that's helping them survive even with white nose present. So still figuring that out. Uh, Easter red bat, this is the one that was from the beginning of my presentation, <laughs> looks like a hamster in a tree. Um, so the male Eastern red bats are very fluffy, very golden kind of mane color. They're beautiful. These guys are solitary tree roosting bats. So we always think of bats as kind of roosting in larger colonies, usually in caves or in structures, but these bats will roost in trees. Um, a lot of these bats generally hibernate, or sorry, generally migrate, but they sometimes will spend the winter in certain areas. And what they do is they kind of curl up like a little leaf in the tree. If it gets super cold, they will drop to the ground and go under the leaf litter and they'll try to hang out there until it warms up. So we always say, you know, if you're in the woods, just be careful, watch where you're stepping, because you never know, there might be a little bat on the ground. There's a very cute children's book called The Little Red Bat that talks more about that that I absolutely love. It's a great book. Um, as I mentioned before, bats usually have about one pup per year. These bats are overachievers, and they can have up to four, which is just unheard of in the bat world, because the pups are quite large. Um, but they, they manage to do it, and, you know, You'll see if sometimes people will find a female, you know, in a tree with like four babies crowded around her. And, you know, these guys could be in your backyard right now and you'd never know it because it's usually just one or maybe a mom with some babies. You know, they, they really blend very well into trees and, you know, but they're around. They're absolutely around and uh, they're very cool. And these are one of the ones that have been, these are sort of our long, longer distance migratory bats. They do not hibernate generally. It's a friend of the leaf litter, as I said. Um, but that's not necessarily hibernation. It's like more, maybe more torpor, but that's like a wildlife nerd nuance we don't have to get into. Um, but these have been, this population has been pretty impacted by wind turbines. It's, it's generally the kind of long distance migratory bats that seem to be um, kind of associated with fatalities that kind of wind turbine area. So something to think about. And then another bat that's a solitary tree roosting bat is the hoary bat. Um, this is another one like the little, the big brown bat that's sort of found all over most of the country. These guys are also long distance migrants and these are, this uh, bat has also been very impacted by wind turbines, unfortunately. 
Um, they're called hoary bats because their fur sort of looks like what we call hoarfrost, which is sort of that very spiky kind of crystally looking frost that you get sometimes. So that's where their name comes from. These bats are very big. I've heard they're quite feisty. I've never actually caught one in a net, but from some of our scientists that have, they've told me they're very feisty and they have big personalities, which just kind of love. So they're a really great bat um, and they are, you know, very uncommon to encounter, but you know, they are out there and they are kind of hanging out in trees. So you never know. So I wanted to spend some time talking about happy things because I know a lot of that is a little bit disheartening, but you know, although the bats are experiencing a lot of issues, there are ways that people can help. So one of the things I like to talk about the most is this idea of making a bat garden. So this is something you can do in your own backyard and it really is something that will help bats. If you think about it, you know, most of us live in urban and suburban areas and they look like these pictures usually where it's grass, maybe a few trees, usually not native species, um, you know, sometimes some shrubs, but again, not native species generally, you know, people used to usually go with stuff that's sort of evergreen or easy. Um, and they tend to be things that do not support native insect populations. And lawns don't do anything for wildlife. You know, lawns don't support healthy insect populations. They don't, and be, if you don't have healthy insect populations, you're not gonna have, you know, any of that kind of higher trophic levels like birds and bats and all sorts of other things that depend on insects for their food. So, you know, we have about 40 million acres of lawn in the United States. I think that number, this was from, I think, 2019. So I'm sure it's gone up since then. People are very attached uh, to the idea of having a lawn. And I would say just let that go because it's, it makes this bat sad. <laughs> don't make this bat sad. Let's go for something different because, you know, you don't have to. It's a lot of work, too. Lawns are a ton of work. I mean, people will try to have lawns here in Austin. And that is just like a crazy amount of water to try to keep a green lawn here. It's too hot. It's too dry. It just does not work. But, you know, what does work is native plants. Native plants are used to the climate where you are. They, you know, once they get established, they require very little care. And they support all the native insects that our bats eat. Like I said, all the bats in your area eat insects. So if you can plant things that support these insects, you can support bats and kind of create habitat in places where there might not be a lot. So for gardening for bats, we kind of try to think of a two-pronged approach where you want to support the food that bats are eating, so support the insects through native plants, and then also thinking about roosting habitat because I say, as I said, some of our bats do roost in trees. So it's good to kind of think about it in like sort of a two-pronged approach. So when you're thinking about providing food, uh, we're just talking basically about nighttime pollinators. And I think we're all, or a lot of people are very familiar with this idea of supporting pollinators or supporting monarchs through different plant choices, you know, in their yard or garden. We're just talking about thinking about those things. And a lot of those plants work for this too, because they, you know, they have flowers that stay open overnight, you know, so that is great. But it's just thinking about supporting the nighttime pollinators, you know, that we're not necessarily seeing but that the bats are eating for sure. So things like moths and beetles and different types of flies. So, you know, nighttime pollinators, they are very attracted to fragrant things, very smelly things. So anything you have that's like fruits, you know, fruit, rotting fruit, ripe fruit, attracts a lot of insects. But thinking about those kind of things that'll bring those native nighttime pollinators in. You know, and like I said, some flowers, a lot of flowers that we love keep their flowers open at night, but some of them do close their flowers. So just paying attention to the flowers that you have and seeing, you know, if they do close their flowers at dusk, like, or if, what if they open their flowers at dusk? So, you know, just thinking about that to have that nectar source and that pollen source available throughout the night. Light colored plants are really good, you know, flowers that are white, that are yellow, things that really pop. Those are the things that attract kind of those things at night that are, are looking around for places to, to land and to eat. And then, Bats eat a lot of moss, you know, they eat a ton of moss. I think, you know, as bat people, people always ask us, do they eat mosquitoes? And, and we say, yes, and they do, but they eat more moss. You know, and a lot of moss are things that are potentially pests to a lot of our garden species. So, you know, you can get super into looking up moss host plants and there actually is some good information. I think a lot of people, you know, focus on host plants for butterflies, which is great. But there is kind of information out there about moths as well. And moths have some really cool caterpillars, like just some really wacky, wild looking caterpillars that are really fun. 
So, you know, just thinking about that as sort of the nighttime approach to your sort of daytime pollinator garden. And like I said, garden plants. So some of the things that you may hate that you have in your garden, like the squash vine borer, that just destroyed all my squash plants last year. Terrible. Like this is bat food. You know, the cabbage looper, bat food. You know, this tomato or tomato hornworm that, you know, will get on your tomatoes and will just demolish them turns into the Carolina Sphinx moth. Like that is delicious bat food. So you know, if you have an organic garden, you're, you're going to have garden pests, but a lot of them are things that bats really like to eat. So I think a bat garden pairs really well with a food garden, as long as you keep it organic and keep those kind of harmful chemicals out of the system. So I just had a couple of plants to recommend. You know, this is by no means a comprehensive list, just something to get you started to start thinking about this. I always recommend goldenrod and, you know, you have to figure out what's native to your area. But goldenrod is this fall bloomer and it drives home this idea of bloom time succession, where you really want to have something blooming as much as you can throughout the year. Because the bats are out most of the year. If it's above 50 degrees, bats are going to be flying. So you want to make sure that there's flowers to provide food for the insects, especially in the fall. You know, the bats are bulking up in the fall either to hibernate or to migrate. They need a lot of food. So thinking about things that bloom in the fall is great for them. And bonus, also really good for monarchs. If you like monarchs, you know, they are migrating in the fall too. They need lots of nectar to kind of go on that journey. So fall bloomers are really great for lots of different species. Joe pieweed is another one, um, not a fall bloomer necessarily, but a very, uh, it blooms a lot. It, you know, pretty much takes care of itself. It doesn't need a lot of care or water once it's established. And it's really just covered with pollinators both day and night. Really great plant. Um, a great vine is coral honeysuckle. There's a lot of uh, the Japanese honeysuckles, the non-native version, which is very common invasive in some places, but there is a native honeysuckle, coral honeysuckle, that is a host plant to several different species of moths, and the flowers also attract a lot of insects too. Uh, yarrow is another one. Um, it has medicinal value if you're into that. Um, it's also very like soft and kind of a, a pretty plant, but you know, it keeps its flowers open all night, is a host plant to certain species of moths, and you know, it's got those white bright flowers that attract nighttime pollinators. Milkweed, I always put on here because obviously it's good for the monarchs, but milkweed flowers are covered with pollinators too. So milkweed flowers attract things day and night. Very, very important plant for many, many reasons, especially monarchs too. Sunflowers, you know, there are lots of different native sunflowers you can plant. They do really well. They're very beautiful. And the best part about sunflowers, well, one of the best parts, because they are just lovely, but once they dry out, you kind of let them dry, you'll get goldfinches coming to eat the, the seeds, which is really fun, and squirrels. You always get squirrels, but it's fun to watch. So, you know, all these plants help lots of different wildlife, but bats as well. Black eye season's another one, beautiful plant, easy to grow, very important host plant for certain species of moths, and again, attracts pollinators in the day and in the night. Narrowly primrose, wild bergamot. There's just a very, <laughs> keep going on and on. These are just some recommendations um, of different plants again. And then I did want to talk about roosting habitat. So, you know, there's kind of a fun bonus when you're thinking about roosting habitat because we're thinking about trees, but trees are also sort of food as well because trees are host plants to a lot of different species of insects and trees have flowers. You know, we don't usually think about trees having flowers except maybe like, you know, magnolia trees or like tulip poplars have big flowers that are very pretty, but all trees have flowers, you know, and they attract, they keep their flowers open at night. Generally, they attract a lot of different insect species. And I always recommend Doug Tallamy's book, The Nature of Oaks, just to drive home, you know, oak trees are amazing. Uh, this book is about just kind of how many different things depend and live within and around and on oak trees and how important they are. They're kind of their own little habitat within a tree. So oak trees are super important. There's other trees as well. I did want to show you a picture of what an Eastern red bat looks like all curled up in a tree. So this is a picture of someone I know kind of stumbled upon this by accident. You can see they curl up, they kind of hunker down during the day and, you know, Usually they're fairly high up. This was the lower to the ground one, but you know, you could have them in your yard and you'd never know it. And you're like, what is that? And that is a bat. It's little heads at the bottom here. I don't know if you can see it. There's the head, there's the ear. Wings are folded up and the tail is kind of wrapped around. 
other trees, uh, the pawpaw is an amazing tree. I know it's not as common, but you can make, I think, jelly with the fruit, but you can also do all sorts of other things. And it's a great host plant for moss, and it's a really cool tree. It's generally great roosting structure. Mulberry, like the native mulberry, there's a non-native mulberry that I don't recommend because I think it can actually kind of um, cause issues with the soil for other things growing. But the red mulberry, the native mulberry, is fantastic. This is <laughs> me in my yard with a bat in my mulberry tree. How amazing is that? Um, other ones, you know, black cherry, tulip poplar, sassafras. There's so, you, you guys are so lucky. You have so much diversity of hardwood trees to choose from in your area. A little jealous here down in Texas because it's not quite the same. Y'all have a lot of trees and, you know, a lot of them are really important for wildlife and they support a lot of insect species and they support bats too. You can't go wrong with trees. Other things to think about, you know, there's dead trees. Some bats roost in dead trees. So if you can leave a dead tree up, that's great. You know, I understand sometimes it's sort of a safety hazard. You have to take it down. It's totally fine. Understand. No judgment. But if you can leave them up, you know, you might, it might be a bat roost. And then this idea of vertical layers. So even if you don't have a large yard, you can really do a lot with a small amount of space by thinking vertically. Just having something at different layers of the canopy, you know, ground cover, shrubs, small tree, large tree, vines kind of connecting everything. You're gonna have much more diversity, have a lot of different ecological niches for different insects, and in turn kind of provide more food and habitat for bats. So vertical layers are your friend always. And you can do a lot with like a very little space again, just thinking in a different way. So we do have a bat gardening guide. Uh, this is the website. I'm also happy to send it to Jim as a PDF, Jim, if you want to like share it with everyone, but it just talks about all the things I talked about here. And we're really excited to kind of be promoting this gardening for bats program now that we've got. Um, yeah. And hopefully we can kind of get more, we're working, we do have a plant list for your area too, Jim, which I'm also happy to share with you if you want to give it to everybody. I have come up with a plant list. I did want to talk about bad houses really fast because I get a, like a bajillion bad house questions a year. Um, you know, with us, we've sort of pivoted away from bad houses. They don't have a ton of conservation value. Bad houses are great for certain species. Not every species of bat's going to use them. If you have, a, as I mentioned before, if you have a bad house or know of a bad house in your area, it's probably going to be occupied by the big brown bats. They are the most common bats and probably the most commonly uh, common bat house occupiers. So that's something to think about. You know, I don't think they, their populations are doing okay for now. So kind of adding that extra habitat isn't as big of a deal. But, you know, if you want to have a bat house, that's great. I would say do it with a bat garden, kind of do both of those things. And then don't just have a bat house by itself. But if you do have a bat house or you want to get a bat house, totally support you. Go for it. Um, make sure you buy a good one. There's a lot of bad bat houses out there. Um, you know, we used to have a bat house certification program. It's no longer active. But uh, some of the places we used to certify still have that like BCI certification, which means it's probably a good bat house. But make sure there's no screener mesh on the inside. Those can break down. Bats can get stuck. So we don't want to do that. Uh, larger is better. And then don't buy bat attractants. Don't buy pheromone spray or guano or kind of anything that people say will, will bring bats to your bat house because it just doesn't work. All you can do is try to install it you know, with all of our guidelines and kind of cross your fingers because there is a lot of nuance to it. They need a lot of sun. They need about six to eight hours of sun a day, but you want to make sure it's sort of southeast east um, because you don't want to get that like hot afternoon sun. So, you know, orienting it in the right direction is really important. You don't want to put it on a tree. I've seen many bad houses on trees that are not successful. I think bats probably don't love those types of bat houses because they are very susceptible to climbing predators. It's on a tree. So we say put it on a building, put it on a pole, but keep it away from trees actually. Have it be about 12 to 20 feet from the ground um, because bats kind of fall out and swoop. And then make sure if you can near a water source, that really ups the chances of it being successful. And then just be patient. If you have a bat house and it hasn't been occupied and it's been sitting there for like two or three years, Try a different spot. You know, maybe there's just something about it the bats don't like. It's really hard to know sometimes. So just generally, other yard tips, as I said, try to keep chemicals out of your yard. Keep chemicals out of our system. Uh, keep fluffy inside, especially at night. Keep cats indoors. Cats, I have cats. I love cats, but they eat a lot of wildlife. They are little killers, even though they're very cute. 
So they will eat bats, you know, if, if they have the opportunity. So keep your cat indoors. And also thinking about light pollution. We found with lots of light pollution, it sometimes can interfere with the bat's ability to echolocate um, effectively. So keeping your yard as dark as possible will help bats, it will help migrating birds, it'll kind of help everything. And I know it's hard because sometimes it doesn't feel safe. So, you know, whatever, you know, a lot of times just having lights pointed down instead of going up makes a huge difference. And then if you do want to provide water for bats, they need about 10, seven to 10 feet to drink because they actually swoop down on the wing and open their mouths and kind of scoop up water. Very impressive. Um, but they're not going to like perch on a bird bath and drink. So if you do want to provide water for bats, you need like a pond, you know, a creek, if you have one near your house, and just make sure it's kind of cleared out so they have kind of that ability to swoop and there's not stuff in the way. You know, they will drink out of pools, especially in times of drought where water is scarce. And I always just recommend having sort of a, a wild like escape ramp on any pond or tub or pool that you've got. You know, because bats, if they fall in, they can swim. It looks very weird, but they can swim. They kind of will just like truck along the side of the pool looking for a way out. So if you have those ramps, you know, they're going to find them. And then you don't have to come out there outside and find like a dead frog or a dead bat in your pool. It's great. It's good for everybody. So with that, I would say last thing, just be a bat advocate. Hopefully you guys think bats are amazing now and, and want to just talk to everybody about them. And, you know, you're welcome to check out BCI's website. Um, it's batcon.org. You can also join our organization, be a member and support our work. Um, but you're also welcome to just reach out to me too. That's my email. And thank you for listening. I will take questions. Yeah. That was wonderful, Erin. That was a superb talk. I'm so excited. Um, thank and you. No, it was, it was excellent. Um, everybody is psyched. Um, and, and I'll start off um, going through the questions that are in chat. We can use some more if you would like. But I do want to point out, I think that it is so cool how whatever the topic of these webinars is, whether they're birds or turtles or whatnot, we always come back to some of the same things. Native plants, turn yep. off your lights yep. at night, keep your cats indoors, don't use yes. pesticides. I love the, what, you, what you really um, taught me tonight was the importance of trees as roosting places, as habitat. Yeah. That's yeah. sort of, that's a new way to think about things. And every time we learn something, you see the world just a little differently when you try and see it through an animal's eye. And I think you've helped us do that. You know, those, the fragrant flowers at night and the white flowers. And um, so I really appreciate that. Um, and you. there are a lot of questions. Let me start going through the chat because um, people are going to have a bunch of questions. Um, my chat is being a little wonky, but um, <laughs> people want, would like to know. Uh, somebody asked about um, wind turbines and what can be done to um, to help the bats. Yeah, that's a great question. So we actually have like a whole wind team. And they are working on it. And there's a lot of things that have kind of been suggested or tested. Uh, one of the things is uh, something called curtailment, which seems to work fairly well. A lot of studies have shown that the majority of bat fatalities happen at low wind speeds. So getting the wind turbine companies to turn off their turbines when the wind is not strong seems to have a huge effect on kind of minimizing those bat fatalities. So that's something you know, that we're suggesting, I don't think they're always super keen on it because, you know, the turbines have become more and more efficient. They're still able to make money, even if it's, you know, a lower wind speed. So it is like a, you know, it's an industry and they're trying to make money. And I think one of the things that really helps is, you know, people, customers demanding that they make their wind that friendly. Because I think, you know, it's one of those things like at some point, hopefully will be regulated in some way, but it's not now. And like BCI, we can do a lot, but it really coming from people, customers, I think has the most impact. So just even calling them and asking them like what they're doing to help the bats or prevent bat fatalities. Um, there's also been like a kind of noise deterrence that they put on the turbines to try to see like if they play a certain sound or make a certain noise, the bats will kind of not want to be, you know, in the area, but it's hard because the sound doesn't travel that far and sometimes doesn't even travel past the length of these giant turbine, you know, they're so big now that it's, it's kind of difficult to uh, to kind of figure it out. So there's a lot of different solutions kind of in the works and uh, we are trying to figure that out. But I will say, I think more people just kind of 
asking questions to win companies and just making sure that, uh, you know, they're thinking about it and that they know that their customers care about it. Cause I think it's one of those things it's hard. We love green energy. You know, we need to, we need, and wind is blowing up right now. Like there's all sorts of wind energy projects happening all over the country, happening offshore. So it's one of those things that's just going to be part of kind of the way that our economy is changing. But I think, you know, if people speaking up and asking questions and really demanding that they think about that, that helps a lot. Yeah, I, I like what you said about being bat advocates. Um, we're all, I yes, hope, wildlife advocates. Do. But don't forget the bats. <laughs> don't forget the bats. No, they need couple, to. <laughs> yes, a couple of things just to lump some questions uh, together so about the the problems. White nose. People are interested in white nose. Is there any hope of a cure? Is there anything that we can do to mitigate the spread? Yeah, so it's it's tough. There's not much that um, the general public can do at this point. You know, initially when it first kind of was on the scene, there was a lot of kind of cave safety protocols to avoid spreading white nose from one place to another through kind of people that were in caves, through their gear, you know, all these kind of like cleaning protocols and things like that. At this point, it's it's really difficult because it is in most places. The places that don't have it are still very strict about that. So you always want to make sure, you know, if you're in a cave, that you're wearing clean gear, that you're thinking about that. Um, but, you know, with BCI, we've, we've tried a bunch of different things. You know, we have, there's sort of some inoculation trials they're doing. Um, there's, people are spraying like fungicide in certain roosting habitats to see if that helps. Like, for example, um, there's a culvert in East Texas, where there's a huge population of uh, tricolored bats. And I think uh, last year or the year before, there was kind of an idea to spray some fungicide kind of in that area to, pr to protect the bats in that culvert. And I'm not sure the status of that, but you know, I think we're kind of trying everything. Uh, we have another program called the Fat Bat Program, which I actually just love the name. And I actually have, I have a logo on my water bottle. You see, it's a very fat bat. Um, the idea is to install kind of feeding stations near known hibernacula, so known places where bats are hibernating to try to fatten them up as much as possible, you know, attract as many insects as possible before they hibernate in the winter. So the idea is to just get them as fat as they can, you know, have as much kind of fat reserves as possible. And then ideally that helps them survive kind of through the winter, even if they have white nose. And I think there's been limited success with that. We had a pilot program with it and it's still something we're exploring, but you know, there's a lot of different studies going on right now with inoculation. Um, you know, and it's just hard because it is everywhere now. And it seems like, you know, the bats kind of are spreading it because they, you know, they sometimes share roosts, they sometimes swap roosts. So it's really hard to kind of contain that spread. Um, but you're welcome. Our website, batcon.org, has more information on kind of all the different things that we're trying right now. And then whitenosesyndrome.org too is, again, a great resource that has a ton of information on white nose and, and can talk about kind of the different things that people can do. Because I know Wonderful. it's sad. It's, it sucks. Well, you know, all these talks that we give have a sad component, but the fact that we're all here and that we got a, a nice crowd is actually, right. yeah. is actually you know, a sign of hope, I would like to say. Two other things. Um, right. The problem with lights at night, could you give us a real succinct rundown? Why, why are lights at night a problem for bats? Well, so it's a couple of different things. Um, you know, light pollution in the U.S., I mean, everywhere, but, you know, light pollution in the U.S. has just it just exponentially grown in the last, like, 20, 30 years, where if you look at, there's, like, a very classic kind of map of the U.S. at night, and if you look at it from, like, you know, 1990 to now, it's crazy how many lights there are, and then someone told me that those maps don't include LED light, so there's, like, so many more lights that's even in the map, so it's just wild to think about how that impacts wildlife, so from the bad point of view, the light is so much feedback that it can kind of scramble the way that they echolocate and make it harder for them to find things if there's too much light. And what that means is, you know, they're not going to necessarily go to areas where there's a lot of light. They're not going to go to areas to look for food if there's too much light. And since there's so much light, that doesn't leave them lots of places to go. So if you have well, a darker least, yard, it's... It, hmm? it creates little food deserts for them because they're afraid exactly. to hunt there. Because there exactly. are things that it's just eat bats, bad ideal. Right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Owls, hawks, cats, sometimes uh, lots of things eat bats. Yes. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's unsafe from that perspective, too. And then from the insect perspective, you know, there's a lot of studies that show that light pollution has had a dramatic effect on the 
just overall decline of tons of insect populations in the U.S. and in the world. You know, it just affects them in, in so many different ways. So that's, you know, that's the bat food. So light pollution is bad for insects, it's bad for bats, and then it's not good for people either, honestly. Like, there's a lot of studies about that too. Right. So just having right. kind of, being able to see the stars is, I think, really important for mental health anyway. Yeah. And there's not a lot of places where we have kind of dark skies anymore, and we're kind of losing that connection, I think, to this kind of larger picture of who we are yeah. as a species. Yeah, so, yeah. we normally talk a lot about Right. We talk a lot about that um, when it comes to migrating birds. And I know that um, yes. that that's an issue in Texas as well. And, and Absolutely, Barbara, yeah. Barbara Bush, of all people, has sort of stepped up on that. Um, but, yeah. But, um, but yeah, there's an exhibit for those of you who haven't seen it at the Smithsonian um, on the on light pollution and the importance of keeping our stars, our skies dark at night and it features in fact our dc lights out program we're listed as nice. one of the sponsors because um because we've been pushing for dark skies for a long time but that's yet another reason to do that um we got a few more minutes noise talk about noise this is another thing that comes up with Ooh, different animals. good question yeah that's a really good question and oh, and there's not a ton of information on that but it does seem like you know in places where there is a lot of ambient noise might be places that bats would avoid for feeding, I will say. So, you know, there's obviously a very famous urban bat colony in downtown Austin under a very busy bridge. That is a noisy place. So obviously it doesn't bother them when they're roosting, but they're not staying there to feed. So they're they're flying way off to like kind of farther east out in the country. That's where they're going to like echolocate and find insects and things like that. They're not really doing that in the city. So I think I think, you know, if you can make your yard as quiet as possible, that's awesome. You know, a lot of times there's like, you know, air conditioners that make a lot of noise or just kind of random lights sometimes buzzing. And, you know, some of it, it might be like higher pitched than we can actually hear, which is interesting. So kind of noise that maybe we don't hear. But I think, you know, just kind of that addition to noise makes it less, you know, of a nice habitat for insects and bats as well. And it just kind of makes it you know, there's just more feedback. So they're getting the light, they're getting the noise, and they're just trying to kind of do this very, you know, very precise thing of echolocation, and all of that makes that difficult. So they're just going to avoid it, which is very sad. What, what I say when people ask about why city wildlife exists is, you know, here in the city, we've done a lot to alter our environment to make it more convenient and more functional yep. for us. But it has unintended victims. When we change the environment, a lot of things we do, like build roads, put on lights at night, different things to make the world work better for us, nice green lawn, um, is actually detrimental to wildlife. And it's time that we start thinking about what we're doing and how it impacts some of the other members of our community. Um, and I, appreciate, I really appreciate your help in, in helping us do that. Um, I, we've got to let Mel go because Mel has been working hard all evening. Thank you, our, Mel. Our, Mel, you're amazing. Yeah, Mel, Mel's a great asset to making sure that all of this information is available to everyone who would like to hear, and we, we do appreciate her help. Big thanks to Aaron, our, our deepest gratitude for a fascinating evening. Um, we're all a little bit wiser and I think more committed. Um, I will put those um, plant lists up on the website as well as a recording of this talk which you should share with your friends. And, and one last thing, I'm a supporter of Bat Conservation International. I really, um, everyone, yeah. if everyone here would join Bat Conservation International, it would be that much more help that these little guys that we now know are so terribly important would get from their friends in Washington, DC. So Mel, thank you. Aaron, huge thanks. Everyone, thanks, thanks for Jim. joining us. There will be more of these talks and um, we'll see you the next time. All right. Thank you. Good night, Aaron. Hey.